So guys, let's, let's get this show started. We are the second to last act between you and lunch and the wonderful picnic. So I, I do think we, we, we should get going. So this panel is on how science can change the world for the better. I want to start by introducing my amazing and distinguished panelists. We have Stephen Chu, a Nobel laureate in physics for trapping and cooling atoms using lasers. Anything with lasers is good. Even my six-year-old boy thinks lasers are cool. <laughs> Stephen was also the Secretary of Energy for the United States, which is an immense position because the US consumes a lot of energy. Vinton, <laughs> just a fact. Uh, Vinton, or Vint, or he likes to be known, Vint Cerf, is credited as one of the fathers of the internet, so all you young people owe him literally your online lives. Mm -hmm. He invented TCP IP protocol and is a Turing Prize winner. Uh, we then have Adriana Murray, who wants to go to Mars. I'm sure many of you have met her. <laughs> she was actually in the audience three years ago, the last time that I moderated this same panel. She didn't remember that I was the moderator and over dinner a few days ago said, you know, that last panel was so boring that time around. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope the guy just pulls up his act this time. And I was like, damn. And <laughs> I'm doing my best, but she's, she's fabulous and she's the former head of innovation for SAP and uh, she is a director of, a founder of... Um, of Proudly Human and a director in the Foundation for Space Development. And she's going to convince us that every answer we seek is on Mars. We then have Brian Schmidt. Brian Schmidt won his Nobel Prize for determining that the universe is accelerating. I don't feel that way about myself, but the rest of the universe is accelerating. And he's also the only Nobel Prize winner from Montana which is like one of the main things on his wiki site. I think it almost comes before winning the Nobel Prize. He manages to sneak that in. So he's obviously a very proud Montanan. And he is the vice chancellor of the Australian National University. And then we have Tim Luce from the ITER. And he's actually going to solve all the problems for everyone because he's going to make fusion happen. There we go. <laughs> so he's got it all under control, actually. The rest of us can, can go to sleep. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, this panel, the fact that we're asking the question, how can science make or change the world for the better, itself reveals that on some level, some of us, maybe all of us to some degree, aren't really sure that it's doing that job or it's doing that job well enough. In fact, just a few days ago, I read that the, the, the flat earth societies their membership has burgeoned to the extent that they can now fill a 2,000-seater or 2,000-berth cruise liner, luxury cruise liner, and they're organizing a cruise in 2020, but they canceled it when they found out that the cruise ship's navigation system depends on the Earth being round. But that's right. <laughs> so. So, but the fact is, it seems that science has a little way to go in, um, in, in convincing us that yep. it can benefit the world for the better. So with that, we're going to dive into the questions. I'll introduce each of the themes and then go into questions for the panel. So my first theme is led by, actually, the genius of Janet Jackson, who made a brilliant comeback at Glastonbury um, with her song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? And, and as a consumer of science, I'm not a scientist, I, I'm really far from that, I, I, I eat what you make. So if you guys make good science, I end up consuming it, I, I eat it. And as a consumer, here are some interesting facts. So in 2013, here at Lindau Nobel, a, a paper was presented by a, a set of Nobel Prize winning economists, and I know that's not considered a real science by many of you other Nobel Prize winners, but for us non-scientists, it feels really real. A paper was presented that showed that total factor productivity, which is the measure of human productivity growth when you strip out the impact of commodity prices or externalities, that it used to grow at 2% a year, very steadily, from 1945 to 1975. But from 1975 through today, with the internet, schminternet, all this stuff, it's actually been slowing down. It's been growing at an average rate of 1% and decreasing. Second point, 
It's well known that in the developed world, real wages have been falling since before the Great Recession. And the third point I want to make is that from 1980 to today, global spend as a percent of GDP on R&D has increased from about 1.9% to 2.35% as per the OECD. So we're spending more money on it, but it isn't making us richer and it ain't even increasing our productivity. We're slowing down and we have been slowing down systemically for 40 years. So as a cons my first question, is science giving us, because we're the taxpayers, the consumers, is science giving us the right bang for the buck? Who's a taker for that question? Brian, of course, there we go. All right, so I'm, I'm actually married to an economist, so um, <laughs> it's really interesting. And she worked for the Productivity Commission. No sure. mic. Try this one. All right. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm actually married to an economist who works on productivity. And it's a really interesting question about whether or not productivity is actually being measured and whether or not we are actually yeah. capturing all the things that we now use. I mean, how do you price the smartphone I talked about on the first day relative to uh, a, a thing of fish and chips of 30 years ago. It is a conceptually very challenging issue. We are spending a lot more in R&D, and it may well be that uh, it's harder, that we're getting the low-hanging fruits and things. Uh, but I think a big problem uh, is that the world GDP is still going up at 3 or 4%. The challenge we're having is income distribution yeah. in the developed worlds. We've always had problems in developing worlds, but the developing world's coming up very quickly. Uh, but income distribution is a problem, and it's one that is inherent in capitalist-type uh, systems. And in the same way we had to deal with monopolies, we're going to have to deal with income distribution. Mm -hmm. but, but even so, where, you know, something like antibiotics or spectacles, these are real big life changers. They mm -hmm. kick ass. The iPhone is just an improvement on the Morse code, instantaneous communication. You know, where, where is the real... You have to take where that. Is the real, where is the real kicker coming around the corner? Vince has just had Sorry, I'm I, I have apoplexy. to be provocative. About it. It's my job to keep the audience awake in this heat. I still, so this is, this is to make sure that nobody complains that it's boring again, right? Okay, so you don't have a problem with this yet. Okay, I'll take this one on. First of all, do you understand the value of connecting all of these bright minds, not just here face to face, but after they go home? What do you think that smartphone is doing? It's giving people access to information they never had before. Science is apolitical for the most part. That's what I believe. I might be dead wrong, but I believe that science is basically apolitical. The big problems we have, like income distribution, are not the result of good science. It's the result of bad economics. It's the result of bad incentives. Science is not necessarily going to solve that problem. Scientific thinking can help solve that problem because it's all about analysis. It's all about finding facts. It's all about putting models together and understanding how things work. So if you want to solve that problem, we have to apply scientific methods to that analysis and come up with the right kinds of models and incentives so we change the way income gets distributed and the way in which work gets done. So, there. <laughs> does, anyone, does anyone want to try bettering Vinton? There you go. Back to your original, Double or nothing, Tim. Back to your original question. I think science has delivered. If you look at healthcare, we've gotten to the point where in the developed world, uh, we're into lifestyle illnesses. The problem is, again, the distribution of that care across the globe. Same with energy. Uh, look at LED lighting. It's given us better lighting, uh, very little energy consumption at the point of use. There's still energy consumption in the making of the LED lighting, and you have to be careful about embedded energy. But again, it's distribution that is one of the issues. Science is moving the frontier, but it's not benefiting everybody in the globe equally. Adriana, Stephen, did you want to pick up on that theme? Well, I, I, to, just to add to it, I'm going to go back to what Vince, Vince was saying about um, how communication has transformed. You know, we, we just heard this impassioned, lovely presentation of the Arab Spring as a beginning, 
uh, and you think about how these things get started. With cell phone communication, this is a means that people can communicate with other people around the world. And so, now, it's not all wonderful good stuff. I, I should say that it also allows us, and Facebook and other things allow us to retreat to our own private bubble chambers uh, and uh, not to listen to other people. But the prospect of having this communication and perhaps society being mature enough to say, this is a flowering of ideas. And so to relate it to how science can help transform society and its process, if you think about how we do science, we take data, new observations, you feed it in, uh, you can use new facts, uh, which, and the facts are established by repeatability and by others. And then it all sloshes together and, and it, it, new understandings emerge. And it's, this is very contrary to what I'm a little bit afraid of, if everybody retreats to their own bubbles and private echo chambers and reinforce preconceived notions. They don't, want, they don't want their bubbles to be pricked by facts. Right. And so the, uh, here's something where I think science is, is a paragon of how we really want society to you know, use these communications to... And it's easy to say, and it's hard to do. I mean, um, it's hard for me to turn on Fox News. This is a very conservative station in the United States, and listen to it. It's hard for me, actually, to listen to some of CBS News as well. So I, I retreat to my own bubble, PBS NewsHour. But, but I do read the Wall Street Journal opinion page, and I do read the New York Times. And so the, to actually get these opposing views and, and try to decide in your own mind, this is the stuff of science. And this is what we should be telling the general public, that you have this and you have to bring this together and dispassionately say, okay, there's challenges in the world and we really need to do these things. And the stuff of science, the backbone of science is, is uh, where I think we can go to a better society. Adriana? Yeah, so perhaps if I could shift the conversation somewhat to think more about the future. Um, I think we're living in this unique era of development in science and technology, and we've reached this point arguably because of these developments. However, we face a period in history of massive transition, and I think we have to understand uh, what, what... I think it's about resources, and I think the revolution that we're about to enter into is one of a realization that our consumption of resources, particularly in the developed world, has, uh, is not sustainable, has not been for quite some time, and in order to have a vision of the future in which we do enable uh, somewhat uh, progress of, of society is to put in place immediate strategies for this. And let's look at the disparity between rich and poor in developing countries such as mine, South Africa. Many people don't have access to the most fundamental requirements to be a human with dignity, and that is power in the most fundamental sense. The sun has uh, you know, triggered the capability for complexity in the form of life to emerge on Earth, and yes, we need power to power our devices to be able to communicate. Water, clean water. So many children die because water is full of viruses, bacteria. Food, nutritious food so that we can learn, so that we can be active in school. And lastly, communications, which I think is now considered sort of a human, a human right. So many of our people do not have access to these fundamental res resources. And that is not going to change as we go forward with an increasing population, because guess what? For now, at least, we still live on the same planet, and that's planet Earth. And uh, we can almost calculate, you know, how many years we have left if we consider, continue at the current rate of the destruction of the ecosystem that supports us. And I find it imperative that we have to discuss these issues and carbon tax, maybe that's a start, but it is by no means enough to enable us to get through this transition period. And I don't think we realize now just how serious this transition is gonna be. We need strong leaders. And having lived through a political revolution in my country, and we've just heard a powerful message, you need strong leaders with a vision of the future. Um, what is that vision? And uh, the founder, I'm the founder of Proudly Human. I've been using that hashtag because surprisingly, no one else used it. You can check on Twitter. One other person from India used it twice, and I've now been the sole user of the hashtag, proudly human. I believe we need to look at the past with pride, 
uh, in sense of where we've, where we've arrived to and also have pride with, with respect to how we go forward. Um, this may be on more planet than Earth, but certainly that's not the motivation to leave Earth because of the destruction that we may cause here. But I think we have to have a sense of pride. We have to have a vision for the future. We can be better, and science and technology is, of course, going to play a fundamental role in enabling us to, to become more resource efficient and to give basic uh, resources to every single human that lives on, on this planet and perhaps others. So, so what I'm hearing from... So what I'm hearing from a bunch of scientists is that the science is good, but what people are doing with it ain't that great. Now, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I have to be a bit provocative here, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too, which means if the science is great, but for example, what politicians or economists are doing with it are, isn't great, hence we have income inequality, we don't have food going to the right people, well, shouldn't we be taking some of those science dollars and then redirecting it to solve those problems? Which then means you get less research, research funds for your labs? Sounds like a terrible idea to me. <laughs> uh, look, science, in a sense, doesn't actually do anything. Uh, what it does is get knowledge. And in order to take that knowledge and do something useful with it, you need engineers. Because the engineers are the guys who transform science fiction into reality based on the deep scientific understanding that we get from the Nobel Prize winning scientists. So I'm not sure that I would argue to transfer those research funds away because the increase in knowledge just creates this huge capacity to understand how to build things that will be helpful. And I, on this point that, uh, that you made, uh, uh, Adriano, it's not just a question of efficiency. I think we're also looking for alternatives. How do we find alternatives for food? How do we find alternatives for energy? How do we find uh, alternatives to accomplishing what we need in order to make life worth living for everybody on the planet? So it's not just a question of conservation, it's a question of using science to discover alternatives that are more sustainable than the ones that we've been using. We've made the assumption that we have an infinite amount of all resources and we've been using them up as if they were infinite and we know they're not. And science teaches us that they're not. So now we have a job to do to find alternatives that are more sustainable. But again, I, just, just to chuck in, a big part of that existentialism, and for those of you do, who do know me will know that I'm a massive crit critic of capitalism, is because they are subject to the capital markets. If they cannot repay their next tranche of debt, they're out. And, and they, they don't have, you know, people don't have faith in them right now. But Adriana, yes. Um, maybe if I could go broad again and say, what is the thing that the potentially general AI systems that we develop are, are not able to do? And I think that's, think, out of the current paradigm. Um, so although my mom would love for uh, AI to go and explore Mars instead of me, um, we're, we're not at that point yet because uh, at least in their current stage, you know, machine learning algorithms don't design missions to explore the unknown, whether it's uh, in a knowledge sense of, of landscapes of exploration of mathematical structures or, or whatever that may be, or to indeed explore beyond uh, the physical paradigm in which we live. So luckily, luckily for me, I'm in an era where if exploration is done on Mars, um, I could be a candidate and uh, not some kind of automated uh, robotic system because although we've made uh, very impressive leaps and bounds in robotic space exploration, missions um, in, the, in the last few decades, and we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing um, just in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I think to make those real leaps, which, and we've seen how the Apollo era influenced, um, there's research that shows kids, whether at high school or, or undergraduate young people who listened on the radio or watched on the television seeing humans walk on the moon, were inspired to the extent that the per capita number of PhDs in science, technology, engineering, and math spike per capita, and it's mm -hmm. never been repeated as a result of the inspiration of that exploratory spirit, which of course is enabled by science and technology that is intrinsic to being human. Um, the computer, the mobile phone, the internet, where technologies uh, commercialized in the decades after that, and there are correlations with this. So I believe um, that one small contribution to enabling us to envisage a future where we can be more resource efficient and enable more of us to live dignified lives uh, will be uh, to step out of our box, to look at our planet from afar and say, this is the most beautiful planet in the solar system. Look at how difficult it is to eke out an existence. For some of us, that's fun. For most of us, not. Look how difficult it is to survive anywhere else, and perhaps that will be the, the unifying uh, uh, achievement of the next 10 to 20 years that will remind us 
what there's no place like home, um, there's no planet like Earth, and to really band together to, to look at practical solutions. So, so one last question before we turn to the audience. I think there is um, a general consensus. I mean, look, a whole bunch of scientists here, you're scientists. I'm, I'm like a, a fanboy of science, actually, even though I've had to poke and prod a little bit today. And that's why I hang around with this crowd. Um, it seems that science is generally good. I think we can agree with that. Uh, it seems that science is doing a lot of stuff, even if I may not understand all of it. Um, but it seems that science has sort of lost, to some extent, its compact, its trust with society. There's been a, a divergence. And, and here's, here's a question. Is it because science has lost its great translators? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to compare John F. Kennedy with Elon Musk. And so what I did is I typed into Google uh, John F. Kennedy moon quote, and this is what came up. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. You're like, damn. And then here's Elon Musk. I typed in Elon Musk Mars. I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact. So has science lost its great translators that, that take the people who may be going out of business in Lafayette, Indiana, or God knows where else, and say, well, actually, I've got to care about this. Who does this today? Do we need it? Holy moly. <laughs> I, have, I have one question. Is, uh, is, is, there, is there a correlation between the fact that Elon and you want to go to Mars? Does everybody in South Africa want to go to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> not because we uh, are not extremely uh, happy in our most beautiful country. <laughs> I challenge anyone to propose a more beautiful city than Cape Town, for example. But uh, perhaps that, and many other cities in our country, uh, but perhaps that, uh, that experience of, of living at the edge, you know, I don't think there's a coincidence that geographically California and South Africa are a group of people who've traveled, whether you're looking at the history of humanity from Central Eastern Africa where Homo sapiens emerged, or whether you're looking more recently at my ancestors who came in 1688 by boat on a one-way trip, and a completely unknown future. They were peasant farmers escaping persecution in France, Huguenot refugees, sold everything they had, jumped on a boat with the Dutch, and contributed to the establishment of agriculture um, in, in the Cape area. And in some ways, what we will do on Mars will be no different, subsistence farming. So. <laughs> <laughs> In politics, well, you'll take over Mars, so you'll be president of Mars, but other than that... We won't have a government. Yeah. Well, that's another discussion for another time. <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that scientists need to get involved in politics, but what I would say is an absolute imperative for all of us is to be leaders. And I think, uh, sometimes I think back on having lived through the political revolution in South Africa that I did and think it was a luxury almost to be exposed to the possibility that when you question a paradigm that seems so strongly entrenched that it's difficult to imagine it otherwise, sometimes you are right. And sometimes you will live through an era where you and fellow thinkers will turn that system around to a better one, to a more ethical one, to a more sustainable one, to a more just one. So whether it's in research or whether it's in whatever field you end up um, doing, whether it's in politics or uh, in technology, which I've now decided is the place for me to really do and really achieve like physical steps towards the goals I've been talking about, and that's to ask the big questions. You might just be the person who, whose big question will spread a, a wave of thinking and a movement that will enable us to look beyond the current paradigm to a better scenario for all of us. So whatever capacity you're in, I would encourage you to, to think out the box. Of course, we do that anyway, but on a global scale and to also uh, take that responsibility of, of considering yourself a leader for, for the people that you spend time with in whatever capacity that is. Uh, I'm going to guess that Adriana might react positively to something, but it'll be very interesting to find out. Uh, homo extraterritorialis or something <laughs> or, or, might actually, uh, or extraterrestrialis is the right way, nice. I like it. Uh, might actually need to be a little different uh, in order to survive in very harsh environments. 
I agree that we don't know how to do that. I mean, this is, when we start messing around with the human germline, it's sort of like squeezing toothpaste out of the tube and then trying to figure out how to get the toothpaste back in again. There are some things that you just can't fix. So we need guardrails, and there have been guardrails established for uh, microbiology, recombinant DNA, and things like that. Uh, so society has to be ready for it. But I don't think we should reject everything just because something might go wrong. I think the, the right thing is to build the right uh, framework in which to do the work. So are you thinking about genetic modification at all? I like that idea. Um, not in the initial stages, I think, because uh, the survival of the first groups that get there will be the, of the highest imperative, and so probably tweaking genetics at that point. So therefore, in my lifetime, it's probably not going to be the, the strategy. But uh, for future generations, you've got some kind of stable off-world settlement. Uh, that would certainly be the future, unless we're going to terraform the planet. The other alternative is to change the structure of, of the human body itself in order to physiologically adapt better to that environment. Um, but then about the, about the ethics of it, I think for me, you know, investigation and, and science and knowledge creation is more about a celebration of trying to understand the reality in which, in which we find ourselves. And I think the extent to which we then want to try to control it is something to be careful about. Um, uh, like, a, like a toddler that gets hold of your smartphone and kind of turns all the settings around and you can't get them back. I think that's what we're kind of doing to the climate, same as the toothpaste. Um, whether we're looking at the, the global climate of our planet or whether we're looking at the human body, these are both mighty structures that are way beyond our current understanding in terms of the delicate interplay between various different uh, forces that keep those in the equilibrium that supports us. Um, so, so I'm not going to make a clear uh, statement about what ethical area, what areas of science may turn out or not to be ethical, but I think we should keep in mind uh, that our, our activities as humans should be a celebration of, of the reality in which we find ourselves, um, maybe less of, of the arrogance with which we try to, try to manipulate it. <laughs>